So, Jack, thank you for talking with me. Where and when were you born? Yeah, so I was born in 1955 in Colorado and then moved to Oregon when I was three and grew up in Eugene. And what month were you born? I'm interested in your astrological sign. Uh, so I am a Leo with uh, Leo rising and five planets in Leo. Oh my goodness. And I was the shyest kid you could find anywhere. I was so shy I would not ask my best friend for a glass of water when I was a kid. So it's a very interesting combination, is it not? <laughs> well, I'm thinking sometimes Leo dignity, maybe dignity means that I don't want to make a fool of myself or do something untoward. I don't know. What, but now you're, you, you're a professor. You're in front of groups all the time. You, you speak yes. all the time. What happened to make the, the shift? Yeah, so um, I think a, a key piece of it was... Um, when I started doing anti-rape activism in 1985, uh, I found myself stepping forward when the TV cameras were turned on rather than backward. There was something about wanting to make change and knowing that this connection was important uh, that just drew me out of my shell considerably. And of course, by that time, I'd also been a professional drummer for a number of years. And so, you know, I guess on one, in one sense, you know, sitting there playing a dirty blues is, you know, is profoundly, you know, exposing yourself as you possibly can do. So, uh, so I, I think there had been a long path out of my, uh, my shell. Uh, and so a couple of major steps, like, you know, playing, playing music professionally, just uh, understanding that I had been telling myself uh, a story about who I was that was necessarily incomplete. And although, you know, the shy person is still in there, it's nothing like the whole story anymore. It, it seems to me the key is if your focus is on yourself and how am I doing, or the focus is on getting the message because I really care about this cause, that that makes the difference for a shy person. So uh, it's, it's no longer about you, it's about the message. Yeah, that was a key piece of it for sure. Um, and then what did you learn <laughs> growing up about what it was to be a man? I'm, I'm asking you this because young men that I've interviewed for the book said they learned around middle school, don't be a sissy, don't be like a girl, don't cry. It was the don'ts. And that seemed very sad to me that it, that it was a lot of fear about doing something that could be perceived as sissy. What, what did you learn? Yes, I mean, it makes me sad to realize that that is still the message. You know, that has been the core of growing up into uh, being a man, you know, who knows how long. And uh, it's one of the things I understood, you know, sort of in the late 80s was that if I was going to be working against sexism, uh, so much of what men's behavior is, is rooted in all of that bullying we experienced around, you know, not being a girl, not being like a girl that is gay. And so if we are going to stop sexism, we also needed to deal with heterosexism and homophobia and all of that. So, yes. Yeah. Uh, I grew up with a very interesting role model. My father was one of the kindest human beings on the planet. Very sweet, very nice, um, uh, interested in the life of the mind, um, and, you know, really enjoyed life and enjoyed his children. And so, you know, I had this incredibly deep relationship with him, though he's now gone from the planet. Um, you know, I'm always pulling out phrases, you know, that I heard him say. Um, and so, you know, my uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas were always fun when I would bring guests home because I'd walk in the front door and my father would walk out of the kitchen with an apron on uh, and, and greet my friend. And then we'd go into the back room and my mom would be watching football on TV. I love it. <laughs> and, you know, this was not so much because he was drawn to being a cook, but because uh, my mother had undiagnosed hypoglycemia, and so she was just wiped out all the time, and somebody needed to cook for the family, so he took that on himself. 
uh, as you know as his role because you know it was it needed doing. Uh, and so you know the the narrow box that most men get, you know, see as a picture of, of how they're going to be a, a man as they age, uh, was not there for me. I saw a much broader spectrum of what it is to be a man. Um, nevertheless, I certainly picked up on a lot of the masculine traits you might imagine. I was uh, actually really good at tackle football. Uh, in seventh and eighth grade, I literally destroyed my knees because, you know, if there were five people in between me and the ball, that wouldn't matter. I would go get the ball. Um, and so, you know, I was good as a linebacker and all of that. And, you know, on some level, I find that incredibly amusing um, that, you know, there are these parts of me that, that never disappeared. But so much of my current persona is around compassion and caring and love. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm curious if my knees weren't bad, whether I'd go back to playing tackle football and be that same aggressive person. We'll see. Hmm. Well, actually, we won't see because my knees are pretty bad. Okay. <laughs> How many siblings do you have and what was your birth order? Yeah, so I'm the youngest of four, two brothers and one sister. And what did you learn from your brothers about, I mean, they, I assume they got you involved in sports because they did. What, what message did you get from your brothers? Yeah, so I have one brother who's a year and a half older than I am. And he and I were, you know, pretty good friends. And, you know, we struggled, you know, fighting over who got the couch and, you know, various things, mostly on good terms, occasionally punching each other out as, as siblings will. Yes. Uh, my five-year-older brother, uh, was the one who taught me how to play football and go mountain climbing and things like that. So we didn't have uh, uh, initially as close a relationship, uh, but there were some key things I learned from him uh, as well. And you know, he and I now are, are really great friends. So it's all sort of come full circle. If you weren't the jock after middle school because of your knees, what was your identity in high school, Jack? The well, um, I, so I went to high school with kids that I had gone to second grade with. And so there was a whole group of friends I had who were, uh, went through, um, you know, all the way through high school with, and, you know, I continued to be friends with them. And uh, I was also a musician. And so there was a group of people who were uh, my, my friends and musician buddies with some crossover with the, the first group. Um, and then I seem to have, uh, you know, I was, was blessed with a mind that works pretty well. And so I was in, you know, the, the advanced mathematics section and so made some friends in that group. Uh, and, you know, and then there was the whole hippie era and I had hair down to my waist uh, by the time I was in 10th grade, I guess it was. And so there was that whole group I was hanging out with. And so... Uh, the, the relationships and the friendships I had were not so narrow, you know, football or no football. I think I had a lot of uh, role models to tap into for, you know, how we make it through this really awkward period of, of what high school is all about. And I had this one, when I went into 10th grade, was really one of the major turning points in this shyness bit because I decided at that point, that I was done with playing that role. And so I went into fall term uh, deciding that I was, you know, or, you know, the, the, the fall of, of my 10th grade in high school. And I decided that instead of being the shy kid, I was going to be the life of the party kid. Wow. And I pulled it off because, of course, I had this whole new group of friends that I could uh, be with, and they didn't know me as that that other kid. And of course, my you know friends from second grade friends, you know, somehow didn't know what to deal, you know, how to deal with me in this new role. And you know, so I pulled this thing on for a full nine months, and then got through to the next summer and thought, okay, well, that was this story about myself that I was putting on. And that clued me into the realization that me as the shy kid was also a story that I had been wearing for much longer. Uh, and so, you know, what am I going to do now? Am I just going to pick a story a year or what? <laughs> and uh, I finally realized that I knew what my innermost core was. And I was going to put that innermost core on the outside of my skin 
and be the most authentic person I could be. And, you know, since that time, I, I've, you know, pretty much done that. And it's been a very successful way to be uh, a human being in the world, uh, to be a, a, a gendered male human being in the world, uh, finding my authentic source and, and, and my authentic voice and being that with everyone. How, how would the people, your peers, describe the third Jack? So we, we've morphed from shy Jack to life of the party Jack to authentic Jack. But who, how would your peers say, oh yeah, Jack's the... Um, I'm not sure I've had that conversation with people <laughs> through that transition. It would actually be, you know, I have some friends who may have remembered all three. Um, but uh, I'm not quite sure. Um, maybe you went to being the, the brainy guy because of the math abilities and that kind of thing. The, I, I guess they call them preppies. Yeah. Bound. Yeah, so, you know, certainly I was pleased at, at, you know, being able to work through some things on an intellectual plane. Uh, but I was maybe more absorbed in playing music uh, than I was with, with being a preppy. Uh, and, you know, trying to figure out this thing of, you know, being now, you know, a gendered male, you know, having made it through high school, you know, how is it that you're going to be anything, you know, in college and working through that. And, you know, it was a process for, you know, six or eight years to try to uh, find comfort in who I was coming to be. So it was not any sort of instantaneous transformation. Right, right. And, Oh, I was some sort of ex. I was, you know, just trying my best. Right. So you were the smart musician with long hair. Be, okay. <laughs> with long hair. Yeah. 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 And I did you... drinking. I could stop drinking alcohol when I turned twenty-one because it wasn't fun anymore. Oh, you know? <laughs> right. No rebellion. <laughs> and the other thing is, I have the same hypoglycemia that my mother did, and so you know, the alcohol was. Uh, you know, going to kick in all of those systems, and that wasn't a good thing because you know, virtually every alcoholic drink is sweetened in some way. So I just threw it all out, um, and you know, so at that point, uh, became like my my father, my grandfather, uh, a teetotaler. Who you know, my grandfather was the first radio evangelist in the nation in 1923. John Roach Straton, out of New York City, he was referred to by H. L. Mencken as the fundamentalist pope. So, you know, then even though I was playing, you know, demon jazz in nightclubs at that point, uh, I was still a teetotaler. And so, you know, I don't know whether he was rolling in his grave or rolling over in his grave or clapping. I'm not quite sure. Or both. So. Did you major in physics in, as an undergrad? No. So here's the interesting sequence. I got out of high school, went directly to the University of Oregon in the same city I had grown up in. Uh, and found that I could only take a photography class if I majored in photography. And so I majored in photography as an undergraduate. And, you know, I took, well, so my, my year and a half older brother, uh, Peter, uh, would, would take various classes. And, and my, one of the things that I always did in life was do everything he did. Uh, and so he took a physics class, so I took a physics class, and he took a computer programming class, so I took a computer programming class. And uh, so it was, you know, I, I started taking these other sort of, uh, sort of uh, physics-based courses through his influence. Uh, but meanwhile, since I was taking this physics class, I was thinking, how the hell am I going to survive this thing? Cause, you know, it was pretty intense stuff. And so, you know, fall term, I signed up for karate thinking, oh, that, you know, that'd be something really different to do right after my general physics class. And that was fine until we got to the part where, you know, you're learning how to punch your fist through somebody's chest and rip their heart out for their <laughs> age. And I thought, you know, maybe this is not exactly my cup of tea. So next term I took a Kundalini Yoga and I walked in there and the first day he had us lifting our legs up and down for 20 minutes. And after that I was more stoned than I had ever been in my life. And I thought, this is really great. I mean, I could go top talk to a cop right now and uh you know and so i started doing kundalini yoga 
Um, and so, you know, that was a, a key piece that comes into this story, which, you know, the next step is I got my degree in photography and uh, did not want to be a wedding photographer. I thought that would kill my uh, joy in the photography. And so, you know, the question is, what do I do now? Well, I'd been playing music uh, all through that era. And so uh, I ended up uh, playing music professionally for about three years in a jazz band. Uh, and uh, w w Bill Sable was the piano player, and Steve Moser on bass. Uh, and uh, we would be out on the road, and Bill was someone who did uh, uh, Zen meditation, and here I was doing my kind of loony yoga, as I call it. Uh, <laughs> you know, he looked at me, and I seemed to be having a good time, and I looked at him, and he seemed to be having a good time, and so we ended up uh, teaching each other, and so we would pr prepare for... Uh, music in the following way. We would do, uh, get up in the morning, you know, do an hour, half hour yoga uh, of yoga, and then go out and find breakfast afternoon, which is always a struggle, and then go, you know, walk through the sunshine for a while and go back to the motel and take a nap and get up at 4.30 and do a half hour yoga, half hour meditation, half hour yoga, half hour meditation, and a half hour yoga. And believe me, you know, any acid trip you would imagine pales in comparison with that sort of build up from doing that day after day after day. And we go down to the club and play music for four hours, which was another form of meditation. And then we go sit on top of the roof of the motel and talk about the nature of reality till four in the morning and go to bed and get up the next day and do it again. And so this was a fabulous life. I mean, I tell you, you know, you can't imagine... Uh, having a life that was more blessed than that. Well, you know, I was bringing in $600 a month to live on, but my, you know, rent was 185 so I could do it. Um, and so that went on for three years, and then Bill had the temerity to decide to move across the country with his wife rather than staying and playing music with me. And I was heartbroken. This was, you know, it was just incredible that all of this energy that I'd put into this creative enterprise was out the window. And so, you know, what do you do? Well, I kicked around for a few years and uh, did some uh, landscape maintenance, you know, for a year with uh, the bass player, Steve, who was uh, very kindly included me on his crew. And then eventually I decided I wanted to go back to school. And since Bill and I had talked about cosmology on the hotel rooftop, I thought, well, hell, I'll just go learn the language of cosmology. So I'll go back and, and uh, get a PhD in, in physics. Uh, and so I went back to the U of O again, got a master's and then a PhD, and ended up not doing research in cosmology, but in quantum theory. And so uh, my, my life to mine now is doing quantum scattering theory. And, you know, it's as joyful an enterprise as anything, you know, I've ever done. The, the photography that I continue to do and the music I continue to do and the creativity that is in mathematics, it's all um, one thing. It's not like uh, I can say, you know, my creativity is over there. It, it sort of percolates through all that I do on a professional level and, you know, on a, a, a heartfelt level. In, in your physics classes, um, is it still true that the majority are male? What, what, what do you find in terms of your students? Yes, so um, I teach mostly astronomy uh, as my, my physics course. I also teach a freshman inquiry course, which is in a whole other uh, department at the university. So the astronomy course tends to be pretty close to, uh, I would say maybe 60% women, 40% men. Hmm. Um, and but in the, the physics field, um, you know, those who are physics majors, it's, it's pretty close to 50 50 now. Um, that's at the a big change, level, it, that's a big change, yes. But at the master, you know, at the master's and PhD level, the numbers go down, uh, and so we're um, you know, now I, I think, and in terms of you know, faculty and whatnot, it's actually pretty poor, it's like 20 percent women and 80% men. So physics has a long way to go in, you know, fixing, I guess, the climate. Uh, there's something about the way that we are being with each other and with the women and uh, women colleagues and with our students that's not working for the, uh, keeping women in the pipeline. Well, you, um, what's interesting, it seems that women go into 
fields like biology, physiology, medicine that are clearly life affirming or you know they're not as abstract. I guess women want things where they can see tangible this is how I'm helping you know save this plant or this person or something. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's any truth to that? Um, I think there may be you know the story that we tell about what physics is about you know maybe uh, part of the issue uh, because indeed you know a scientific uh, a person with a scientific mind you know goes into biology or physics and you look at biology and you know half of every level are are women you know although of course you know women faculty struggle in biology as well as physics but the numbers are way up uh, you know whereas in physics it's much lower and so you know there's a lot that we need to sort through and the whole uh, you know national organizations are focused on you know, we really need to work on this. And we've been saying all of this for 20 years now, uh, and we still need to work on it because it's, you know, making some progress, but it's, it's not good enough. How did you get interested in diversity issues, gender issues, violence yeah. prevention? Yeah. Um, so one of the turning points in my life was when I was getting my PhD in 1985, there were a couple of rapes on campus at the University of Oregon. And the Women's Resource Center there said, uh, any men interested in forming a men against rape group, phone in and, uh, and uh, we'll get it going. And so I phoned in and waited a month and then I waited two months and you know that was the fall. And then by 1985 in January, I went in and, and you know, explained that I had phoned in and the woman handed me a list of men who phoned in. And at that moment, I realized it was my job <laughs> to call all these people. i had been waiting too long. And so, uh, you know, we organized a group on campus, you know, the first meeting and those who showed up, there were a couple who thought we should form a service to escort women safely across campus. And, uh, the other four of us thought maybe there's something more fundamental that we need to do, but we had no idea what it was. So I went over and, and talked to the Rape Crisis Network in town, the activist feminist women who were working on uh, uh, ending sexual assault and domestic violence, and they were very skeptical of yet another group of men wanting to do something because they had experience of men who wanted a great deal of praise for very little work. Uh, but they are willing to give us a chance, and ultimately, you know, under their tutelage, we learned how to do presentations in classrooms. And what we learned, you know, early on is that, uh, you know, we think about the rapist as some stranger in the bush, but indeed, the vast majority of rapes are committed by men known to the women. That is, normal men, because Dang women right. aren't normal men. And so, if normal men are raping women, then normal men can talk to normal men about it and try to make sure that that behavior stops. Um, and so uh, that became, you know, very clear that there was a great deal that men of good heart can do uh, in, in trying to stop this, uh, this literal war against women. Um, and so, you know, the group in Eugene grew from four to 21, down to 12, up to 18, and down to one and a half when I left. And uh, so I moved to Washington, D.C. and started uh, Men Against Rape there. Uh, and uh, this group, uh, interestingly, uh, actually has survived to the present day under a couple of name changes. Um, so uh, originally it was you know, D.C. Men Against Rape. Uh, and then I was there for two years. I was on postdoctoral uh, fellowships that lasted about two years, hither and yon, for about 10 years. And so uh, as I, after I left, uh, the group decided that they didn't want to be against something. They wanted to be, uh, you know, more positive than that. So they changed the name to the uh, Men's Rape Prevention Project, which, of course, was very positive, but had the unfortunate acronym of Mr. PP which uh, they realized was not going to fly for, for very long. And so uh, currently it's uh, Men Can Stop Rape. And they do magnificent work. And, you know, the, the fact that they're doing magnificent work, I can't take uh, credit for because I didn't do all that great work they're doing. But I provided a spark that other men came and other men came and other men came in sequence 
uh, to keep this great work going. So I'm very appreciative that they're still rolling over there. And if being an escort is not the only thing that men can do, it sounds like educating other men is is the key. Is that what you found is the, the focus should be? Yes. And so we need, you know, to go back to our, you know, five-year-old, seven-year-old kids and, you know, on up and, and talk to them about, you know, the, the fact that they can't be this, they can't be that, they can't be the other. Certainly there, there's a piece of that that, that needs reform. Uh, and also respect, you know, uh, respecting girls, respecting women, finding common cause, finding identity. Uh, James Baldwin uh, said you cannot oppress someone. I'm sorry, in order to oppress someone, you have to disidentify with that person. And so, you know, learning how to identify with women. Uh, is is a key piece, and then you know the you know the the, the respect uh, needs to carry over into acknowledging boundaries, and you know and then not brutalizing women. I mean, it's like that last step seems like something that is you know a no brainer, but apparently there's uh, plenty of men who feel like they're entitled to it, and they're also educated into who are the appropriate targets for. Uh, that the, whatever's bubbling up in them at the moment. So yes, education and education and education uh, may well do the trick, but it's a long-term prospect. There, there's some kind of um, urban myth, I guess you call it, that a, a lady-like good woman doesn't say yes, even if she means yes. So if if she doesn't give a, like, absolutely not, then then it's the man's job to uh, get past that uh, polite no, which she really doesn't mean. Yes, and, you know, so the instruction to the boys and men is push and push and push and push. And, it, you know, if you have some integrity at some point, you actually, under, you know, hear some sort of no, then you stop. Uh, but would it not be better to explore the joys of the human body, you know, in concert with your partner and, you know, find what is enjoyable and fun and, you know, work towards consent, work towards, you know, a, a situation in which you're not hearing no or resistance, but someone is inviting you to a beautiful experience. Would that not be a better way to go in life? You know, I certainly think so. But people always say that rape isn't about sex, it's about power and control. Yes, um, and, you know, it, it's complicated because that's what the power and control is what men are taught that sex is, you know, uh, tied up with. Uh, and it's, you know, it needn't be that way. And so, you know, if you look... Well, you know, there's a societal uh, basis for all of this. Uh, there's this interesting study done in 1977, I think it was, by Peggy Reeve Sanday. And her thought was, okay, so, you know, if, if uh, there's something natural about the way men are in society, uh, you know, maybe we want, we want to go to the most naturalistic settings possible to see what, what the, the root of human behavior ought to be uh, for, you know, male sexuality and male behavior. And so she studied uh, tribal societies around the world, and she found that out of 98 tribal societies, 48 were rape-free, and 18 were rape-prone, and the others somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. And of course, we live in a rape-prone society. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if there is some some education from this study that we can apply to a, 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 a um, industrialized society, it is that there's something about our culture that is way off. And so even though we are going to work on, you know, individual men educating individual boys, we have to rethink the culture itself, which is, you know, this, this, uh, this huge force behind the education of individuals. So, you know, as with racism, we understand that sexism is an ism, the way communism and socialism and capitalism are systems, their world's view, they are, you know, methods to uh, reinforce power. 
And, you know, we are living in a sexism in which power is the fundamental thing. And so that that should come out as expressed in sexuality should not be a surprise to anyone. We are living in a worldview in which power is the key. You know, in advice book to women about how to attract a man, a, a theme that I've seen a lot is men need a conquest. So don't be too easy that you have to make him really feel like he's conquering to get your attention or affection or whatever it is that um, they want a conquest. So I, that, I've seen that widely. So that, that does set up that kind of, well, women don't really mean it when they say no attitude. Yeah. Um, there's this very interesting film called Amandla, uh, A Revolution in Four-Part Harmony about uh, the revolution in South Africa and the, and the role music played in it. But there's this one quote from um, uh, Ibrahim Abdullah talking about, you know, you see this woman standing on the corner, a black woman with a black child, and this bus comes along and it says whites only. And so she does not get on the bus. And her child looks up at her and says, why, mama? And so um, uh, he says, the whites made the laws, but the blacks had to enforce the laws. And I think that very much the same happens in our society around gender. You know, the, the, the male culture has crafted this civilization we work within, uh, but it's often the women who have to enforce the rules of it. And so the stories that you hear from, you know, advice columnists, you know, around what women are supposed to do in order to attract a man, you know, all of that is folded up into this culture. And my advice to young women is, be authentic, be yourself, and someone is going to be drawn to you. And you may be drawn to that other someone and look for people who are authentic in their lives. Uh, and what you'll find is that, you know, a deep connection is where all of this should start. It should start with friendship. You know, sexual attraction is, is fabulous. It's, it's wonderful. But choosing a partner based on the heat level uh, is maybe not as wise as choosing it based on how much you like this person, how much fun they are to be around. You find yourself becoming a better person when you're around him. An, an example of that women enforcing the patriarchal rules is female genital mutilation. It's not men who are cutting mm -hmm. off girls' clitorises. It's their mothers and grandmothers and aunties that do it. So, yes. yeah, that's... That's sad. Um, what about uh, custody? That's another issue that you've gotten, had leadership in. <laughs> yes, so uh, I guess while I was living in D.C., I got wind of this uh, organization, a national organization, now called the National Organization for uh, Men Against Sexism. No mas. Uh, no mas, no more in Spanish. <laughs> um, and so uh, I was drawn to that. That's why I, I uh, took a, a road trip up to... Connecticut, New Haven, uh, and uh, attended my first conference. And I had been, in some ways, the solo driving force behind the two men against rape groups that I had, had formed and then worked within. And it was an amazing experience to walk into a room filled with other men who had been fired up to do something, you know. So there was John Stoltenberg and John Cohen and Jim Hannigan. Uh, and, you know, it was just amazing to sit in a room with 26 other men and some women who were fired up to do something about ending violence. Um, and I need to pause just a second and plug my phone in. I forgot about that detail. So hang on. Okay. <laughs> I'll read you Jack's bio. Assistant professor at Portland State University, founder of Men Against Rape Groups in Eugene, Oregon, Washington, D.C., and Manhattan, Kansas. He's published extensively in professional journals from his research in quantum scattering theory, gender equity, and diversity training methods. He served as co-chair of NOMAS and as co-chair of the NOMAS task group on child custody issues. Um, it's recognized as one of the leading writers and speakers in the country with expertise on ethical public policy issues related to the overlap between child custody, 
child abuse, abuse and woman abuse. And he's published in Atomic Theory, Computational Physics, Nanometrology, Cortic Diode Electron Mirror Design, Anti-Bias and Diversity Training, Warming the Campus Climate for Marginalized Students. Whoa, what diverse interests. Great. <laughs> Okay, is this on now? Yes. Uh, we see your thumb. Okay, yes, now I'm charging. Okay, okay great, thank you. Uh, um, yeah. So how did you get from that first meeting with NOMAS into uh, custody issues? Yes, so uh, about two years after that, I got a we all were given all the ending men's violence part of NOMAS were uh, sent this uh, message from John Stoltenberg saying, I have an inch high stack of articles on child custody. This is a huge part of the backlash against the women's movement. We need to get on this. You know, is anybody willing to, you know, take up, uh, you know, this burden? And I thought, God, no, I got too much <laughs> going on in my life. Yeah. Uh, but then I thought, who else is going to do this? So I said, yes, please mail me the packet. And so I read through this thing and started taking notes and got a fabulous education on the ways in which uh, men who abuse women will use the court systems to uh, continue that abuse, to continue to get access to their wives, and of course, some of the men will also abuse their ch children, and so they can use the courts to continue to get access to the children. And so, you know, I'm, I wrote up this summary of what I had uh, um, discerned from this one-inch high stack of legal briefs and what, and you know, academic papers, and sent it off to the Ending Men's Violence Group. And ultimately, Nomos decided to form a new uh, child custody task group, which I chaired at the time. And so uh, I spent uh, a number of years writing on behalf of women who were facing, you know, overwhelming odds against uh, their retaining custody of their children because their abusive husband was a lawyer who could do all sorts of stuff and they couldn't. Uh, or, you know, you know the, the, the ways in which courts have been biased against women, uh, you know, protective mothers of children you know, get labeled as unfriendly parents uh, because they don't want the abuser to have access to their children. And so they get their custody taken away from them and, and the abuser gets the children. Wow. And so the court systems have been uh, set up to privilege uh, manipulative, uh, verbally and, and physically abusive men uh, to... Uh, either get custody or pressure uh, their uh, former wives and partners into lower child support payments uh, in order to avoid having, you know, joint custody and things like that. So uh, over the years, uh, you know, this has uh, uh, been a long struggle and I was, you know, somewhat uh, effective at creating ideas, but not very effective at actually helping women. Um, uh, more recently, uh, Barry Goldstein came onto the team, and he's a magnificent worker in this area. And uh, the work that he's done has far outstripped anything that I started to do. And so, you know, I, I, you know, my hat is off to Barry, and he's really taken up most of the work on this issue now for our organization. And you know, he's written a number of books on the subject. Uh, Barry Goldstein, uh, look him up. It's uh, fabulous ways of thinking through it and reformulating uh, the the ideas in a way that actually makes some sense and, and legislatures are starting to think about maybe reforming the ways in which the courts are set up. As, as I understand it, it's just what Kansas and Missouri that have joint custody, legal and physical, as a preferred mode. It's, it's very unusual to have it as the preferred mode. I thought it was in California, but someone told me it's not. Uh, there's various layers of, of joint custody in the various states, and uh, I have not been keeping up on all of this really now for about two decades. I, I most most of my uh, activist's attention has switched to uh, looking at racism 
and figuring out how to make, uh, you know, uh, try to move us forward on the idea uh, that we don't need to still be in the 20th century and all of that stuff. So I have not been keeping up uh, with the child custody uh, arena and which, which states are doing what. Uh, but, you know, there are many ways in which you can have, you know, uh, a, a, if not a presumption of joint custody, uh, at least, you know, if one, one parent asks for it and the other does not, then the parent who asks for it there, the presumption is that, that they should get the custody of the child, whereas the, the parent who does not want it knows that this is the abusive you know, father, uh, does not get custody. And so even though it's not you know, explicitly a joint custody presumption, there are various ways in which the idea of, of the best interest of the child being joint custody uh, comes into play. The, the men's rights activists like Fred Hayward their point of view is courts have been biased against the father and more likely to give custody to the mother, even if it's a, you know, good father. What what would you say to them? Well, um, if you actually look at the cases, what you'll find is that that's just nonsense. Mm -hmm. uh, whenever uh, custody is contested, uh, it's much more likely that the man is going to get custody than the woman. Because he has if more look, money for a good lawyer. Yes, or he is a good lawyer. Um, if you look at the entire spread of custody cases, what you find is that it's more likely for women to get custody than men. Um, and so, you know, on one level, this makes perfect sense because women have been the primary custodians of the children as they've been growing up. And, you know, they're the ones who takes the kids to soccer and, and you know, buys their clothes and feeds them. And so, you know, after a divorce, it makes a whole lot of sense for that person who has been the primary caretaker to continue in that role. And, you know, the courts have, you know, very often said, yeah, that makes a whole lot of sense. And so, you know, most of the time that happens because most of the time women are the primary caretakers. It's only when we get into the disputed custody uh, cases and, you know, where very often there is, there is an element of violence that then everything flips on its head and the men find that they're able to manipulate the system much better than the women can, you know, try to argue their, their justice case. Uh, and you'll find that uh, the, 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 the uh, outlook for women is actually pretty dire. Mm. Warren Farrell's point is that the boy crisis, as he calls it, is caused by a lack of male role models that teach things that men can best teach boys and he he thinks that the the court system is is to blame for that what did you how would you respond to him um indeed i think it's very useful to see both men and women in action in their lives as adults you know when i do presentations on gender issues i always have to have a, a woman as my co-presenter so that the people can see us interacting with each other and respecting each other um and you know in some ways the, the actual words that tumble out of my mouth are much less important than the way i treat my co-presenter and so, you know, I think a very similar thing applies when you're looking at relationships. A child growing up, seeing a respectful pair of adults, male and female, uh, you know, working together for the child's benefit, even if sometimes they piss off the child by taking away, you know, some privilege, you know, that message is really key. And I think boys need to see that as, as girls do. Uh, however, seeing a, a, a a, uh, a pair of adults in which one is manipulating and controlling and abusing the other, uh, I don't think that, that is going to be a really great role model for either girls or boys. Um, and so, you know, certainly children who, uh, you know, are, are living with a single mother are going to be yearning for that, that other role model. And, you know, very often we'll find it in a teacher or, you know, a, a minister or a coach or somebody like that or, you know, the, some older male friend. Uh, and that's to be expected. And, and we need to, you know, make sure that those uh, role models are uh, available. But there are a couple of, of uh, very interesting studies. Uh, Finkelhor, I forget the other two authors on, on the study, found that children who had not been in contact with their fathers 
uh, after a divorce for five years generally did better than those who were in contact with the fathers. After uh, divorce. And, yeah, a second study, and I, I forget the author's names, you know, more or less said, you know, it doesn't seem like it makes that much difference for the children one way or the other. And so when you, when you realize that so many relationships uh, have an abusive element to them, it shouldn't be surprising that this statistic uh, turns out that, you know, having a family that is relieved of the ongoing tension and storm clouds of violence um, on the horizon, you know, being relieved of that actually is a benefit to children. I, I did so, a book called Kids Advice to Kids, How to Survive Your Parents' Divorce, and that's what the kids uh, said. It, the hardest thing was being in the middle of conflict, and yeah. if, if the conflict ended after divorce, they were glad they got divorced, and being in the middle of the conflict was what they didn't want. Yes. And there are, you know, lots of opportunities when the, when the child is, you know, a teenager and, you know, into the 20s and 30s to, to form a different relationship with each parent at that point. And, you know, there's a great deal of growth that happens. You know, growth doesn't stop when you turn 18, as I well know, now being 65. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we continue to grow and there are lots of opportunities for men to... Uh, realize that they want to have a relationship that is a real one with their children. And, you know, if the children are, are interested, they can actually make a go of, of trying again uh, at a little bit later point in life um, when, uh, you know, he has decided that uh, the, the controlling behavior is not working for him either. There's, there's this lovely phrase uh, Booker T. Washington came up with in the 1920s, and, you know, he said it in, term, uh, in the context of race, and he said that in order to hold a man in a ditch, you have to stay in the ditch with him. And we can translate that into the gender context. In order to hold a woman in a ditch, you have to stay in the ditch with her. Mm. And, you know, so my advice to men is, why are you in the damn ditch? Get out of the ditch. Go out and play on the meadows and have a much fuller life. You don't need to be in the ditch holding women in that ditch. Um, and, you know, if men would take Booker T. Washington's advice uh, in, in this matter, I think that there would be a great deal of positive transformation in our society. Hmm. Do you have children, may I ask? I do not. Um, let's talk about being co-chair of NOMAS. What, what yes. was your goal when you were co-chair? What, what were your priorities? Yes, so this was 1990, and John Cohen and I uh, decided that we wanted to try our hand at running this organization. Uh, and the organization is an interesting one because it was made up of four distinct groups. We had the Ending Men's Violence Activists, we had Gay Rights Activists, we had men studies scholars, and we had uh, men who were interested in enhancing their lives. Um, and so when you would get around a council table with these four really different uh, groups of people and try to work out common cause, it was, it was uh, a great education in communication and facilitation, which <laughs> you know I have used for the rest of my life. Um, but what we found was there, there really are ways to find a commonality across some pretty divergent points of view and, you know, move forward together. You know, you don't have to have everybody agreeing with you on absolutely every point to have an organization that works. Uh, and so it was a great joy to work with John Cohen on all of this. Unfortunately, John has passed now. Um, but, you know, one of the sweetest, kindest uh, most caring and fun people you could ever hang out with uh, as my co-chair was like, wow, this is really great. I was on the uh, NOMAS male, female, men and women's task group and I was so, those are the best meetings that I've ever been in. They'd start with a check-in, they'd have a, an agenda with a time certain so people didn't just talk and talk and talk like in most other meetings. And yes. If you wanted to change the time, you could vote to do that. And then people ended with kind of an evaluation and kind of summary statements. So the meetings really got things done, and they included the emotional component of how are you feeling to check in at the beginning. They, they were wonderful meetings. And M&M 
conferences are really fun. People dance and have fun as well as talk about making social change. <laughs> That's right. I mean, my, my life in those conferences was, you know, waking up in the morning, getting some breakfast, and then having a pre-conference meeting around, you know, sexual assault issues, and then going to workshops for a while, and then having a lunch conference around, uh, you know, domestic violence issues, and then, you know, going to more workshops and having a pre-dinner conference around child custody issues. And, you know, you would be exhausted by the end of this. And so being able to go and dance yeah. with other men, with the women who were there, uh, and just shake it all loose was, was fabulous. And uh, so, you know, it was a really different sort of conference than the, uh, the tie-wearing conference that yes. you might have seen. Yes. Uh, when my son but, was young, we, I took him to the M&M in Seattle. And it was great mm -hmm. because men played with him, they roughhoused with him, and he was on Shepherd Bliss's back you know, piggybacking around the room and that kind of thing. And I, you, you're right, you wouldn't find that at a regular conference, even at a feminist, a women's movement conference, there would be a separate place for child care. That there wouldn't have been that same kind of let's play with the boy thing. Yes, and as you're saying, the, the process was central to what happened. That is, there were process guidelines always in evidence. And so what you'll find is if something was happening at the content level that was just not clicking, you know, someone to say, I think we need to talk about this underlying issue here. And so you, you, you know, jump down and talk about the underlying issue for a while and resolve that there was some, you know, conflict that happened because someone did something or who knows what the conflict was. And then, you know, after that was resolved, you could come back to the content level and then the issues would be resolved. And then you move on to the next issue. And then, at, you know, at the end of each meeting, there would be time set aside for process to talk about yeah. how things went, what your feelings were as you as you end up this intensive process. And it, it made the meetings actually something you would want to go to rather than something you would dread. <laughs> yes, that's that's I felt that exactly. I was at uh, I think it was in Hartford conference and what surprised me is to me I think dialogue is wonderful. But there was a big debate because they didn't want um, I guess it was Fred Hayward, Warren Farrell, Jack Cameron. It was the quote unquote masculinists. They didn't want them to speak. And I said, oh, I think that would be so interesting to have a dialogue. And, and then one of the um, men's studies guys said, well, would you want to have a Phyllis Shafley come to a women's conference? I said, I would love to debate Phyllis Shafley. So mm -hmm. that, that kind of purity, you know, who's the most pure ideologically. I think that I see that in any liberal group just about. So, you know, we're the pure ones and you're not so pure. Yes. Yeah, so that particular conference, uh, there were some men attending who were uh, pretty badly disrespecting the women in attendance. And so there was, there was essentially a revolution within the anti-men's violence wing saying we can't have this you know this is inappropriate that women who come to this conference are being abused verbally by men who come to the conference really yeah They're abused so in that, what way i did i had no sense of that at, at hartford yeah well disrespected you know you know what are you doing here you don't belong that sort of stuff um and so you know that was uh you know, a moment when, uh, you know, the organization really needed to look at, you know, are we creating a place that's safe for women to be? And, you know, are there some things that we need to do or not do so that this would be a safer place for women to come to? Um, and so, you know, I, I totally, you know, I absolutely love having conversations with people who are politically different from me because there's so much that I learn and it's a joy to try to communicate across what seem like fissures sometimes. Um, and so as a general rule, I think that that's a great idea. There are some times when it's important that um, uh, provocateurs and you know just rude people not be invited to uh, a, a, a conference that is supposed to be building and nurturing and, and joining together. So, you know, I can understand 
your desire to want to have these conversations. And I think they're absolutely key for us to have, um, you know, in the present political climate. I think that, you know, we all need to have more conversations that are the difficult ones. Um, and yet, you know, if I'm putting together a workshop, you know, around, you know, uh, bringing black and white people together, Chicanos together, Native Americans and so on. I'm not going to invite the Proud Boys in. <laughs> You know, it's it's just not it's not sensible to do that. Right. But I I would love to sit down and have a conversation with the Proud Boys on a park bench somewhere. You know, uh -huh. one of them, and you know, just see if we can come to, uh, uh you know, come to some sort of uh, meeting of minds. So you do diversity training. What what is that? What do you do? Yes. So uh, I came uh, into Portland State in 1994. Uh, and they had this new program called Freshman Inquiry, which is a year-long interdisciplinary course uh, to take the place of what I got in college, which was you know one science, one social science, and one literature course. Uh, and so our job was to teach really four goals, uh, uh, communication skills, critical thinking skills, uh, diversity skills, and ethics uh, and, and social responsibility. Hmm. And so, you know, really a fourth of what I was supposed to be doing in that class was, you know, teaching about diversity. And it, it was very clear to me that Portland had prided itself on being this liberal bastion, but, you know, you just, just scratch the surface and there's all sorts of issues around race that, need, that still need attending to. Uh, I have one dear friend who, you know, uh, came here from London and she said she never thought of herself as a black woman until she moved to Portland. So, uh, you know, I focused very intensively, uh, starting at that point, on race as the central discussion of the diversity uh, conversations I'd have with my students. Uh, and then toward the uh, later 90s, uh, if this was the anniversary of the, the founding of the Oregon Territories, 150 year, uh, and the Oregon Territories were set up as uh, an exclusion state. You know, not slave, not free, but exclusion, that is, no blacks allowed. Uh, and so we had a uh, conversation around Oregon around that, and uh, a group called uh, Uniting to Understand Racism formed to have community dialogues. Uh, and so I started attending those and then facilitating those. And ultimately, uh, there's one group, uh, these were six-week sessions every Tuesday night for three hours or something. One group did not want to stop meeting uh, after our six weeks, and so that group has continued now for 20 years. Whoa. Uh, and we continue to have these incredible conversations around, centered on race, but because we know each other so well, we can bring in gender and talk about that. And it's, it's not a way to flee the conversation, it's a way to deepen it. You know, we can talk about sexual orientation, we can talk about class. Um, and, you know, I can't imagine going through life not having a group I can talk to on such a deep level. And so it's been a real joy for me. And, you know, I, I teach these classes and, you know, occasionally I'll mention that I'm in this long-term interracial dialogue group. And sometimes the students look at me and say, are you nuts? You voluntarily go to something like that? But it just fills me up with, you know, incredible friendships and deep learning about myself as well as learning about other people. Uh, that you just don't get in any other any other, any other medium other than through conversation. Do you pick a topic like, you know, we're going to discuss the impact of Trump's attitudes towards um, rapist macho guys from Mexico, or or is it just free flowing, or how is it structured? The group. Um, in part. Uh, well, so we just have a check-in, and people talk about what their life is like the last month or so. Uh, and very often out of that, a topic will emerge. You know, someone was harassed on the train, and so they just want to be able to have their reality validated. And so, you know, everyone's sitting around and listening. And it's, it's not, there's not that many venues when, you know, a Chicano can talk about being profiled on the train and have a bunch of Anglos sit around and say, God, that was really shitty. You know, I'm really sorry that happened to you. Uh, you know, most often there's denial and minimiza minimization and, you know, and false universalization and various other schemes that we do to try to get away from these sorts of topics. But having a deep conversation 
and actually being heard is is really good for the for the person who's dealing with this stuff, and for the rest of us to help ourselves understand, you know, our role in this society and how, you know, we are not the good ones sitting around talking about the bad ones, but we're all taught to do the same dance. As Phyllis Frank says, you know, the choreography, we're all taught the same choreography, and the fact that we're noticing that we're dancing it at times is is eye-opening and, and really liberating to actually take a look at, at what the dance steps are and understand that, you know, it's not so much an individual thing that we need therapy for. We need to be working on the systems and understand how the systems are behind a lot of what's making uh, people of color's lives miserable and women's lives miserable and so on. Like the education system where poor neighborhoods have poor schools and so you don't go to college because you didn't get the background training? Yes. And, you know, so the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond does this magnificent training on uh, institutional racism. And, you know, they first clued me into the fact that virtually every institution in this country that was not formed under the period of slavery was formed under the era of Jim Crow. And so when we're sitting here in 2021 and we know that the institutions are not uh, reforming to a better form easily, that really shouldn't come as a surprise when we realize that they're built on this incredible substructure of, of uh, you know, oppression that's been going on for 400 years. Uh, institutional molasses, you know, from all of these years of doing it the way that, you know, it has been done. And so uh, it's important to understand how the systems, you know, come into play. And it's also important to understand our roles in these systems. So, for instance, you know, if I am someone with uh, you know, a little bit of prejudice around race, for instance, uh, that I may or may not be aware of, and I sit within an institution like the university I sit in, uh, if, if those prejudices come out in a subconscious way as I'm working, writing letters of recommendation for students or, you know, hiring new candidates for something or other, uh, or, you know, you know, if I'm unaware that that's a possibility, the chances are that the power of the institution I work in can magnify my individual prejudice by a great deal. And so, you know, you can, being a mathematician, you know, the equation that pops to mind is that oppression is uh, institutional power times prejudice. So, you know, whatever little bit of prejudice you have gets literally multiplied by the institutional power. Um, and so, you know, in some ways, you have to look at me with my phenotype, and I'm a more dangerous person than Billy Bob Smith is out in rural Idaho in a white nationalist community, because he may not be connected up to institutions at all, and he might be, you know, viciously anti-black, but uh, the chances of him harming an African-American man in this society are less than the chances I would if I'm not conscious of my, you know, prejudice and, and all of that. And even if I am conscious, you know, sometimes it seeps out in, in very strange ways. So uh, our roles in the institutions need to be examined carefully. And we all need to work on our unconscious bias uh, in order to uh, free ourselves of some of this stuff so that we're acting in more uh, humane and just manners. Do you think that the impact of Trump was healthy in the long run because he exposed all the racism, classism, sexism, misogyny, or do you think that in the long run it's harmful because he magnified or expanded what was there? Uh, he gave people a voice uh, which they are readily using um, and uh, that voice has been pretty vicious. Um, and so, you know, given an alternative universe, I would imagine that there are many paths through to bringing the voices of people who don't feel like they're being heard by, you know, the more liberal end of the political spectrum. There are many universes we could have gone through to maybe deal with that issue that would have been a much more positive universe than the one we happen to find ourselves in. Right. Um... What, when you look at the men's movement today, it seems to me that the biggest, most popular branch is the small men's groups like from the Mankind Project or Every Man. 
um, that that's, that's where most of the energy is, but your perspective may be different. What do you see in terms of men's movement writ large? Uh, yeah, I mean, you can look at the, the Christian men's movement, and there's the Promise Keepers that was a big, you know, enormous uh, number of men coming together to look at masculinity uh, and, you know, maybe not in ways that I would agree with for the most part. And I actually was on one TV show with some of the promise keepers talking about all of this one time. That was kind of fun. And then, you know, that's we're talking hundreds of thousands of men in that case. And then there is what has been roughly called the mythopoetic men's movement. You know, that is men who want to get together and, you know, talk about their absent fathers and, you know, maybe meet in the woods and, and you know, dance and bang on some drums. And, you know, we're talking maybe tens of thousands rather than hundreds of thousands for that group. And then there's, you know, the activist men's movement, which, you know, we're talking about 8,000 or maybe hundreds of men who were doing work trying to end men's violence, trying to end heterosexism, uh, trying to end racism, you know, through through the lens of uh, anti-sexist work. So that would be NOMAS, the Division 51 of APA men's studies groups? Yes, so, you know, men's studies scholars, there's, there's many more now that are not affiliated with NOMAS uh, than are, but they are, you know, seriously examining uh, you know, gender issues uh, in a way that, you know, I very much approve of. Um, and so, you know, really the ending men's violence cohort is strong and, you know, dedicated and doing what we can to uh, to transform the planet. And, you know, sometimes just speaking out is is enough, but, you know, getting out and working in your community and finding some ways to be involved and, you know, go educate uh, young men about, you know, the ways you've been harmed by your gender socialization. There's lots of roads open for people. And, you know, one of my criticisms of the mythopoetic movement is that I always have wanted, you know, well, what's next? You know, you've you've talked to men for a number of years now and you've enjoyed being in their company. Is there not something you can do with this reservoir of joy that you've, you've uh, filled up? And, you know, the parallel criticism of the ending men's violence movement has been, you know, a lot of it is, you know, lashing out with no firm center to your being, you know, trying to, you know, gear, go here, there and, and yonder uh, without a central focus in your life. And so I think the two movements actually are incredibly complementary mm. and should do more bonding together and try to figure out, yes, how do, how do the most activist men in our world, you know, find a better center and how to the most... Uh, interested in centering, find more activism in their lives. I think you're right. That's the key. I, I see the myth, the myth of poetic as the father of like the Everyman and Mankind Project with the small groups. Do you, do mm -hmm. you agree that they're, that's the same lineage? It's about finding your inner strength, inner warrior, or whatever they call it. Yes, I've been sort of disconnected from that discussion for a number of years, so I'll, I'll take your word for it. That sounds plausible to me. <laughs> okay. Um, then are you... What, what I see with young people is they don't really... They're, they're not really concerned so much about gender. They're gender fluid or they're non-binary or... You know, I have a grandson who just turned 11 and they don't... They don't say girls have cooties, like mm -hmm. when I grew up. So it, it seems like things have changed in terms of um, acceptance, not seeing the other gender as um, so different from you. What do you see in your students? Yes, so I see students who are 18 and on. Um, uh, I think more I've noticed with the younger people that I've known, you know, just through family and, and social life. And it does seem like, you know, the pattern instead of, you know, isolated couples of, you know, one boy and one girl going out on a date, it's often groups of boys and girls going out together. And I think that's wonderful. I think, you know, really, as I said earlier, you know, relationships built on friendship are so wonderful and, you know, foundational to anything else that we get in life. I, I think that's really good. Um, you know, I think that there has been some movement. I think that we're doing better. Uh, I think that even, you know, with gender fluid and 
uh, you know, uh, people uh, feeling free to express, express themselves in this society, there is still a great deal of sexual assault happening. There's still a great deal of violence happening. And so it's, it's great and not sufficient. We need to be doing more to really stem the tide of violence. I mean, we are living in a literal war on women. You know, you know can you imagine that, you know, if, uh, you know, Protestants went out and, you know, 25% of you know, Methodists were beaten up by Protestants you know, and another 25% of Methodists were, were beaten up by, I'm sorry, Presbyterians, not Protestants, Presbyterians, and another 25% were experienced an attempted assault, uh, physical assault by Presbyterians. You know, the newspapers would be all over about this religious war that's happening. And yet when we talk about 25% of women having been raped by the time they're in college, and another 25% surviving a, an attempted rape, you know, that's like, oh, well, that's normal, or we don't even want to talk about that. And so, you know, we really need to reframe what it is we're dealing with here and, you know, call it a war and then figure out how we, you know, go to the peace table. How do we actually stop doing this? And so the main, do we go back to education or what, what do you think is the main avenue or avenues to stop the war? Yeah, so education is a piece of it, uh, you know, having, you know, systems in the, in the police and the courts that do not uh, disadvantage women is a piece of it. You know, having more women in the political sphere is a piece of it so that, you know, young men, you know, look up to, you know, people in power and see women. And that, that's okay. They don't, they don't have to feel uh, strange about that. Having more women in, you know, the professions, uh, you know, in sciences as doctors, all of that is really important. And so, you know, we're absolutely moving forward. I don't want to put a damper on the idea that things have not gotten better. But we've got, we've got quite a ways to go. And, you know, I'm going to be long dead and buried before anyone who say, I think we're pretty close to having, you know, a, a society in which women are equal and treated equally and not bludgeoned, you know, and that's pretty saddening, but I'm not, it's not unexpected given how, you know, we, we are, we've come out of an entire culture, you know, for hundreds and thousands of years in which, you know, women were, you know, barely better than cows, you know, chattel. And, you know, now great strides have been made, but still that culture, that, that legacy, that long, you know, chain, ball and chain that we're dragging along trying to run out of the ditch up into the meadows, you know, it's, it's going to be plenty of work, you know, because all, you know, that huge legacy that we're bringing with us. Well, one thing that women have going for them is now there's 60 percent of the university students in the U.S. are more likely to graduate. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think is happening to those young men? Why aren't they in university too? Yes, I'm, and you know, one of the things is that I, I really grieve for the young men who are lost in society. Um, and I, I think that indeed there are young men who don't see a path to uh, the self that they want to be. And you know, so you know, men who are slightly older uh, need to have conversations with you know, their, their teen peers. And, you know, maybe ancient people like me need to have conversations with, with uh, the slightly, uh, more than slightly younger uh, men and boys. Um, and so, you know, this is, this is something that needs doing because the lack of a sense of self and self-worth is, I think, tied to some of the acting out that happens. And so we really need, we don't need to slap young men down and boys down because they're part of this horrific war against women. We need to build them up and, you know, make them understand that they're incredible, beautiful, uh, you know, creative individuals who have every promise coming forward into life and they need to find their center and, you know, express it in everything they do and move forward hand in hand with the women and the girls in their lives. You know, I, th I think about, you know, there was this one girl I knew when I was uh, five years old, and we did, you know, glitter painting together, 
and whatnot. And then, you know, as you were saying, in, you know, second, third, fourth grade, all of a sudden the girls were something you had to avoid because, you know, they were just these strange creatures. And then, you know, in seventh grade, you're put face to face with them and you're supposed to kiss one of these things. It was like this, <laughs> oh my God, can you imagine, you know, what's going through a young man's mind or, you know, a boy's mind and going through a sequence like that. And, you know, I think maybe th things have gotten somewhat better on that line, but still it's, that's not so outrageous that you can't imagine it not happening today. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think understanding that, that gender is not such a big deal, you know, that we happen to have the particular parts we're given for genitals, we happen to have a particular in inclination, uh, attraction to people, uh, we may not actually feel as good with the genitals we're given as, as maybe the other set. And, you know, all of this is, uh, you know, the, the fluidity is a good thing. And I think those of us who are, you know, confirmed cisgender folks can also, you know, marvel at, at you know, how beautiful it is that we feel good in our, our gender roles. Uh, and, you know, I think, um, you know, understanding how our beingness is separate from the gender that we, you know, you know, as I've learned from gay and lesbian folks uh, through in how to be uh, have friendships across gender lines and how to be free of some of the boxes I put in. Also, I'm learning from the transgender folks that I know to understand that who I am and who I am as gendered are not the same thing. Uh, and so, learning how to be, you know, a beautiful human creature on this planet uh, is central to all we do. I think, you know, here we are living in this land of, you know, uh, people who were uh, much better stewards of it and, you know, maybe more sensitive to uh, those who have variations in the way they are in the world. We need to learn from them as well. Uh, and, you know, there's plenty of the original people who are still in our communities that we can learn from. And, and maybe that's, that's a step I haven't, haven't taken and some others need to, to learn from the elders in, in the, the First Nations, Native American, Indian communities. You know, what are some of the things about gender that you can teach us? Like uh, accepting there's two spirits. So there, yeah. there's some and, people that are just a third it, category. Yes. That's right. Um, okay, <clears throat> finishing up. I'm, I'm read um, Medium, which I think is mostly an online newsletter that mostly young people. And what, what I'm seeing a lot on that is young men saying, <clears throat> all I hear is toxic masculinity. Um, I feel like we're, men are blamed for everything. All I hear is the future is female. Um, I'm made to feel guilty for being male. Um, I'm That... that that's striking to me. Uh, yes. So uh, let me uh, talk to the last point first, which is the guilt bit. Uh, and so one of the things that we find is that guilt uh, is not a very useful response for anyone. Uh, my friend Tess Weisart spells it out as going under into a lifetime of timidity, <laughs> guilt, or change the last letter to tyranny for, for some of the men. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that you'll find is that there are some men who feel so bad about sexism that, you know, we'll pull into our shells and then you all, the women, can take care of us because we're just feeling so emotionally overwrought here. And, you know, that's not good for the women because they have other things they need to do in their lives and take care of the men. And the men need to just set the guilt aside as useless and get out and do something in the world, make the world a better place. There's nothing... There's no need for us to be bemoaning anything about the world in front of us. We just have to work. And, you know, with that, we can transform it into the world that we want. Or we can sit around and bemoan the world that we have and, you know, feel guilty or put upon. But, you know, that's not, that's not a path, you know, out, out of the ditch by, by, any, by any means. We need to figure out ways we can get ourselves out and get our women partners out. Uh, of this situation we find ourselves in that was not of our making. I mean, there's no reason I should feel guilty about uh, any sexism I picked up on in my life because I never asked for any of it. 
You know, I have to take a fire hose and stick it in one ear periodically and try to hose my cranium out, get rid of the crap that's hanging from the roof of my cranium. But I, you know, picked up as a child, pick up on the bus, pick up in the news media, pick up from ministers and teachers and everybody. It's all coming in all the time. Uh, and uh, so we, we need to be hosing our crania out periodically. <laughs> That's great. Um, and, you know, that will help some. But we also need to be looking inward and finding our, you know, true, beautiful, loving core and knowing that that's where we need to be. And that's how we need to be is being our true, beautiful, loving core for those around us. And if you are that, everything else is superfluous. It doesn't matter what other people think about you if you know yourself to be the solid human being that you are. It does not matter, you know what they're saying about you or what they're saying about people who look like you. You know, look like you has new meaning. You are the precious individual self you're meant to be. And if you're trying to be some other individual out there, like the one you see on TV or the one you see on the basketball court or whatever, and that's not you, you're just going to be miserable trying to be that one. Try to be the one that you are and your life will be rich. Yeah, I'm thinking of like all the women who spend money on nose jobs and other plastic surgeries so they'll fit some image that and how painful that that must be yes i mean the phrase that that you know popped into my mind uh, a number of years ago when i was talking to the women in my classes is you know women paint their faces so that men will love them for exactly who they are <laughs> i mean is that not only bizarre but saddening <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. That you. There are movies where the woman. Oh, I. It was like Dustin Hoffman played in Tootsie, where he 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 didn't want to go to sleep because the makeup when he was being a woman would come off. Or and I think there's some women like that. You know. Yeah. Um, okay. Great. Yeah. Okay. I have a, a physics question. Can I ask you that? And then we'll. Sure. Be okay. So I I have. This seems so important to me, but I have a total non-background. So let me see if this is accurate. Quantum entanglement says if we have two electrons and they're paired around the nucleus, they become entangled. If we take this electron and we send it to another solar system and change the spin, this one instantaneously changes in response. So that means there's no wave function, and it means there's a field of information that connects everything. Okay, is that true or not true, what I just said? That's an excellent description of this whole strange business. So yes, of what we find is that there, uh, you know, you can take two particles that are entangled far enough away that there's no way for a beam of light to give information from one to the other about which state of polarization they're measuring, or whether the spin up or, or spin down. And so this is what Einstein called the spooky action at a distance. He was the one who came up with the thought experiment, you know, essentially posing this as the thing. And he said, of course, this could never happen. Uh, and therefore, your quantum physics is all bogus. Yeah. Well, you know, in uh, 1973, Alan Aspe did the experiment for the first time using photons and showed that indeed that the polarization of the photon that you measure over here and over here, so far away, they could not communicate with each other, were complementary. And so there's something fundamentally going on that is not, uh, you know, not as Einstein would have preferred it. So there's, there's this uh, very strange reality we're dealing with. And, the, you know, I'm at a loss as to explain it, how it works. Uh, I just, you know, find joy and say, God, this is bizarre. Is it accurate to say there is an information field? There is nobody who can tell you what's accurate. We, <laughs> can, can, we, can, say, we can say what we observe, which is that the, the two polarizations appear to be entangled even at large distances, and the two spins of, of electrons are entangled even at large distances. How that is happening, no one really knows yet. So there's plenty for physicists to do. So those of you who uh, you know are watching this video or, or reading in the book, you have plenty of work ahead of you. Please do this work because you know before I'm you know 97, I would like to know 
uh, you know, a decent explanation for this. And I haven't read one. Maybe there is one out there and I'm just oblivious to it. But, you know, I think it's, it's one of the beautiful mysteries of the universe uh, that uh, Einstein was right and wrong simultaneously. It is spooky, <laughs> but it's, it's spooky, but it's real. Yeah, spooky action in the distance was his was his phrase. Well, if and you, it really if, happens. If if you if the goddess came down and said, Jack, you have to come up with a theory as to what this connection is between these entangled particles. What allows this? And she, and she said, you've got to do it, or I'll kill all the cats in the world, or something. What would you come up with? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've actually had the thought that, you know, there are a number of friends I have who go to uh, 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 channelers of, you know, higher, higher power channelers and whatnot. And I really wanted to go, you know, hang out with one of those people and say, OK, so just, you know, channel the equations for me, please. But somehow I've never gotten around to doing that. It would be really nice to have those in hand. Edgar you know, Mitchell so channeled of formulas from the spaceship down here. Uh -huh. To the Institute of Noetic Sciences, um, so they, they've they've done it, but not just our question. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, given a great challenge, if I could see a path to it, I would do everything I could to solve that. Uh, I'm not I'm not feeling the that I have in my basket of tools what's needful at this point. We have to talk to a channeler. What what is quantum scattering that you do? Oh yes, so uh, I've been working on a project uh, in support of the uh, the CERN Collider folks. Um, they have a lot of anti uh, anti protons that they've been producing in the collider, and so of course naturally the thing is to mix those with anti electrons, also called positrons, and form anti hydrogen. And so their their uh, idea is we need to measure anti-hydrogen to see if it gives off the same spectrum as matter hydrogen does. And we need to measure the gravitational fall of anti-hydrogen in the gravitational field and see if it's the same as the fall of hydrogen. And so the folks working on that second problem uh, said, but it's hard to cool the anti-hydrogen down to a low enough temperature that you don't have all this vibration. And so and we can't cool a neutral particle very easily, you know, using electrical or magnetic fields. It's just really hard because there's no handle. There's no electrical handle to pull on. It's a plus and a minus giving you essentially a zero. And so they asked me to calculate what, you know, the, what would be the probability of adding a second positron to that so it would then have uh, a net positive charge on it. And then they could cool it using conventional positively charged matter and then strip off the final uh, positive charge and do the gravity measurement. So uh, that's been the center of what I'm doing. So the scattering is, you know, bringing in a second particle and having it interact with an atom. And that's that's what we call scattering. And would in this it, case, it's actually bonding to the atom. Would it have any help understanding dark energy or dark matter, what you're doing? So um, we don't understand what dark matter is at all, except that it doesn't interact uh, with conventional matter in any way except for gravity. Uh, so there's actually a couple of beautiful pictures of what gra uh, dark matter does. There's one called the bullet cluster uh, you can look at, uh, in which you see uh, two ga galaxies that have collided, and in the center you see this brilliant uh, matter uh, glow of x-rays given off. And then on the left and the right, you see, well, they've used gravitational lensing to plot out where the matter has to be in order to bend the light in the way that they're seeing. And so you actually see a photograph of essentially of dark matter and the fact that it went right through the collision region without noticing at all, whereas the matter interacted with the other matter vociferously. So we have a, a, a thin window on what uh, dark matter does and doesn't do. Uh, dark energy... Uh, is even less knowable than that. So, you know, as they say in the lovely book, Arcadia, you know, that to be alive at a time when we know absolutely nothing is the most glorious time to be alive. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. 95% of the universe we don't know anything about. That's right. <laughs> That's a good note to end on. Thank you. I really appreciate the time that you've given me. I learned a lot and 
Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. It was, it was really a pleasure to talk with you. Okay. And I wish you well on your project. Thank you. Okay.